I mean, it's only, I only have 10 minutes. There's not enough time to talk about math. You probably know, want to know, like, what's it like to be a mathematician? And um, I'm having a very typical mathematician's experience right now. I got invited to an event, and everybody in the audience is dressed a lot nicer than I am. <laughs> and, um, you know, that happens to mathematicians and to rock stars. But, <laughs> it, but it happens for really different reasons for rock stars. Rock stars just do it because they're cool. And mathematicians do it because we have this giant spam filter in our brain. And so when someone says, don't forget, you're supposed to dress up for this event, it just goes straight into the spam folder in your brain <laughs> so you have more room to think about math. So that's one of the things it's like to be a mathematician. Um, I have found, especially, you know, we had these two years when we really couldn't be together as people and kind of rejoining the community has made me think a lot more and appreciate a lot more about what it's like to be a mathematician and how I came to understand that. And I think, I can tell you, and I'll tell you some of the ways I got interested in math, but every single one of those things had to do with meeting another person that somehow recognized something in me or taught me something. And it, you know, I think I spent a lot of my life thinking math was something I learned by myself, reading books, and I, I look back, I've now I've been a teacher for many years, I've had 40 graduate students, I, and, I, and all of these, every story is really a story of people connecting and, uh, and helping each other learn and seeing things in each other. And so I wanted to share some of those thoughts uh, with you today. Um, I think when I was, uh, you know, I didn't know what it was like to be a mathematician when I was little. I knew about numbers and I knew about counting and I used to lay in bed and just count as high as I could. I thought that was really cool and really fun. And at some point I figured out I was never going to get to the end of all the numbers, but I also just didn't care because I just <laughs> wanted to keep doing it anyway. So I pretended I didn't know you could get to the end of all the numbers and it just counted and counted and counted. Um, I also really liked calculating things with numbers. I liked calculating square roots because they were either easy, like the square root of 9 is 3, or they were hard, like the square root of 5 is 2.236. I, I could say that to 15 decimal places when I was in fifth grade. Um, but yeah, everything, um, I think when I first, the first thing that made me really realize I was connected to something in math was when I learned this proof that the square root of two is not a rational number. Do you know that? Have you, do you know that theorem? You, you learn it at a fairly young age. But, uh, and I, I remember just thinking it was amazing that you, that th that you could organize your thoughts enough to be able to prove that. And I, I still find it, you know, I've taught it and I, I, it's not really a surprise to me anymore, but I, I think that was something else that really appealed to me about math, that it was something that was extremely organized. And uh, that's, that's something that was, a, that was, that was me. I'm, not everybody I know in math likes that. People like the language of mathematics, but people have very different sensibilities about it. Um, I eventually, oh, and why was I reading that proof? I was in eighth grade, so I was 13 years old, and I was a little bit bored with the books I was reading, and the teacher saw that, and she let me just read ahead. She took me out of the class and let me read ahead, and, you know, several chapters later in the book, the proof of that was there. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't just me studying these books on my own. There was somebody that recognized something in me and opened a door. And, you know, as, as a teacher and as a thesis advisor, you know, that is, in a way, the most important thing I've learned I, I, over the years is I try to recognize something in, in every student I meet. And, and, it, and it, the older I've gotten, the, more I've, the better I've gotten at recognizing things. So I became an algebraic topologist. That's my field of research. And um, why did I become an algebraic topologist? Well, I mean, back when I was young in the 70s, there wasn't an internet. There wasn't any, anything like that. A lot of people had encyclopedias. And I was over at a friend's house, and there were these series of little books published by Time Life magazine. And there was one on math. 
and it had a section on algebraic topology. And in that section, it showed a guy in a suit and a vest, and he managed to take the vest off without taking the jacket off. Now, I still don't really know what that has to do with algebraic topology, but I thought, this is cool. I, I want to learn this, and I can't wait until I'm old enough to have a jacket and a vest. And so eventually I did. I got old enough to have a jacket and a vest. And the first thing I did was like walked up to people and go, you want to see me take this vest off without taking the jacket off? <laughs> and that was sort of an embarrassing thing to do, but it was an incredible filter because most people were like, no, that's stupid. But <laughs> if somebody liked it, then they were a math person, right? And so then I started connecting to math people. So. So that was, you know, that's how life is. There's a bunch, you're exploring things, you're rejected for being a nerd or something. You're always rejected, and then you connect to, to math people. And so, so that was a good thing. Um, another thing later that, that really opened a door for me, um, I was at Northwestern as an undergraduate, and I was lucky to get to hang out with a lot of the math grad students. And um, I didn't really know people very well, but there was a good friend. One person who became a very good friend was a guy by the name of Henry Seaton, who was a graduate student when I was an undergrad. And I still remember uh, the first time uh, we were all reading things, and I, there was something I was really confused about. And I said, Henry, I'm confused about this. Can you help me? And he goes, sure. And so I took a piece of chalk, and I went up to the chalkboard, and I just went like this. And he said, I think you're about to lie. And the next thing I wrote on the board was wrong, and it was the mistake I made. And I, I don't know, he, he had a knack for that, and we all did for each other. And there was something there that I connected to about intuition. And there's something, we mathematicians, you know, we're, we, 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 we come up with problems, we encounter problems, we solve them, we use algorithms, we use various things. But all of us have an experience of just knowing the answer once in a while. It's kind of why mathematicians are really terrible when, they, when you're dividing up a check at a restaurant. You, know, you have to divide some complicated number by the number of people at the table. And I, you know, you're used to just looking at something and having some intuition about what the answer is. But it, you, know, you, you, don't, you don't do that. Uh, in a, in a, you just don't know. You have to calculate it. But that was something else that, that Henry, you know, he saw there was something about that honing intuitions and understanding that um, that, was, that was also very meaningful to me. Um, my memory is not as good as it was. So I s was one thing mathematicians also do is write on napkins with pens. And I, uh, I had to make some notes, but um, it's just because I'm not... Uh, I just want to make sure I don't forget everything. Looks like I'm doing good. Okay, so another another thing, uh, another thing later on. I mean, I I went to college. I connected with the graduate students there. But really, the reason I became interested in in algebraic topology, besides that vest trick, was just the people. I had a lot in common with the people that were doing doing algebraic topology. The, one of the world leaders was at Northwestern, and he, he was so friendly and it, so easy to talk to. And, I, and um, I think it's important if you're, to recognize that, that if you're, if you're looking for a career in math or whatever you're looking for, you're going to be joining a community of people that, that does that. And you're often sort of worried, uh, do I understand this area well enough? Am I good enough at this? But the, if you feel connected to the community of people doing it, you're gonna, you'll grow into whatever understanding you need. That's an amazing sign that it's a good intellectual match. So I suppose if there's a lesson here or a thing I'm trying to get across, it's that um, you know, there's the math you work with, the math you're learning, but there's the people in the world that do the math, and, they, and, the, and they're the people that bring things out in you, that make you understand the things you're good at, the things you're not good at. And, uh, and that's, it's as important to engage in that, and, and it's as important to think about that as it is to study the math. I um, had... Uh, 
one of my graduate students, so this is, an, uh, somebody else mentioned, this is one of the great gifts about being an academic, especially a math professor, is you have close friendships of people of really different ages from you. I have dear friends in their 90s, I have great friends in their 30s, I have, I have close friends of all ages. And uh, often your own students become friends. And one of my students, uh, Ina Zakarevich, became a very close friend. And just a few years ago, um, this, is, this is a story about becoming aware of what it's like to be a mathematician. I was having some problems with some personal relationships, the way some people were acting, and I asked Ina about it. And she looked at me and she goes, people are things that have the following list of properties. <laughs> she listed a bunch of properties, and then from those properties, she derived the behavior of the people <laughs> that I was having trouble with, and I was like, all of a sudden, oh, I can understand it. You know, I just needed to hear this set up as an abstract formal system that wasn't <laughs> confusing, and I was great. <laughs> so that was a good one. I think it's also important, as you, as you learn math, there's things that you are going to come easy to you and there's things that are going to be hard and there's just nothing wrong with that. You have to accept that. There's things I, I still, I've found hard my whole life. Sometimes someone explains them to me and they, they get easier, but I can go back and try to read something I, I found hard to understand when I was in college and I still find it hard. I, um, un, uh, so, uh, uh, Lovash told us that when he was young he wasn't good at, uh, at soccer, at football. Um, I didn't play when I was young, but when I was in my mid-40s I got into coaching youth soccer and then I became really obsessed with it. And so I play now and I, um, I, uh, I had a friend who was a professional player and he kind of used to coach me and at one point, you know, I said, you know, I, wa I really want to be that guy in front of the goal that's razzle-dazzling everybody and and knocking the ball in at funny angles. And he said, you're never going to, don't even try, you're never going to be any good at that. <laughs> and I was like, no, I'm not, I'm going to really, but he was, he was right. I just didn't have the right mind for it. And I had to learn, and there's things like that in math that I'm just not good at. And so another thing to remember is if you're struggling with something, it, it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. There's, math is hard, some parts are easy, and don't, don't let that be a barrier. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I still have to look at my distributed memory. I have a few, how much time, how's my timing going? You've got 10 minutes now, but you can I can go on forever because this is great. Okay, <laughs> no. Um, okay, I have two, two little things to say. So one is, um, <clears throat> in grad school, you have to go through this transition of going from being a student where you're learning math to being someone that's inventing it. And for some people, they just, they just do math, they just prove theorems right. For some people, and I was one of them, it's an enormous threshold to get over. And I, I've helped many students through that. And when I, when I look back, I look at all the people I've known, I look at myself, I think there's, a, there's something valuable to think about here, that when you're learning math, there's understanding is just around the corner. You, you've, you've read some theorem, there's a bunch of knowledge, you're confused about something, but the proof is written right there. And the goal seems to be that you're understanding stuff all the time, and you're proud of what you're understanding, and you're telling your friends. But when you, when you go to, as a professional mathematician, I spend most of my time not knowing the, what's going on. I spend most of my time not understanding. And and I wish, in my dream world, right, the sort of, the culture of math would be one where we, f at all ages, we honor and we respect our, our not knowing the answer. That we respect the state of not understanding. Because what we're really trying to do is, is move to understanding, but that doesn't make you the champion. It makes you, you know, you're just the one that in this group of people not understanding something finally shed some clarity on it. And this is something, I, I, you know, I, I urge my students to be kind to each other in this way, just because someone who doesn't understand something, th that's not a negative. They're in the state mathematicians are in most of the time. <coughs> And I think that's something, as you go forward, as our community kind of reunites, just to sort of recognize and value this state of not understanding things.
So, all right, that was a preachy thing. Um, I, d I just wanted to end with a story. I, um, I still am surprised and delighted by the most simple things in math. So I was talking to my sister the other day, and she goes, you know, and I, she was born in 1964, and I was born in 1958, and I turned 64 this year. And she goes, you know, you are the age of my birth year. And I go, yeah, that's right. And she goes, you want to know something amazing? And I said, what? And she goes, I'm the age of your birth year. She turned 58 in the same year I turned 64. And I was like, that's amazing. We're so connected. I love you so much. And she's, I love you so much. We're so connected. And then we get off the phone and I go, that is so unique. I wonder, I wonder, how, I wonder how much of a coincidence that was. And I started realizing that happens for everybody. That's not unique. <laughs> that always <laughs> happens. But you know, I'm like a 64-year-old professional mathematician. I can still be surprised by something that simple. And that's another great joy of being in math. So, all right. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>